Good evening. I'd like first of all to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which we stand and pay my respects to Elders past and present. Hi, my name's Cathy Van Extel and I'm from ABC Radio National's Big Ideas program and it's my very great pleasure to host the final of these GOMA talks in conjunction with the Patricia Piccinini Curious Affection exhibition which is on here at the Gallery of Modern Art until the 5th of August. The exhibition is occupying Goma's entire ground floor, if you haven't seen it yet, and it's a retrospective of her most recognisable works from the past 20 years. There's a suite of immersive multi-sensory installations, including a large-scale inflatable sculpture, uh, which was especially conceived for the gallery's expansive spaces. She's known for her imaginative, yet strangely familiar, lifelike hybrid creatures. And Patricia Piccinini invites us to think about our place in a world where advances in biotechnology and digital technologies are challenging the boundaries of humanity. Goma Talks is a program which is presented in partnership between Quagoma and ABC Radio National. And in this two-part series, we're exploring our complicated relationship with the future we're creating. Tonight, my special guests and I are going to be exploring the questions, what is our fascination with creatures that are built in our image? And how far away are we really from the creatures that have been imagined? Goma Talks is interactive, uh, which means that you can take part in this discussion here in the live audience at Goma, or if you're watching via the live stream by tweeting your comments and questions to the hashtag Goma Talks. You can also SMS us on 0488 Talks, and we'd really love to include your perspectives in this discussion. Uh, we're recording tonight's discussion for broadcast and podcast at a later date for Big Ideas, so if I could ask you to make sure that your phone is on silent, I'd be very grateful. And who knows, perhaps that'll be a redundant quest request in the future as the lines between biology and technology blur more. Um, so let's introduce our panel. It's been two decades since Dolly the clone sheep, remember that one? and the first isolation of human embryonic stem cells. More recently, genetic test editing through CRISPR has opened up a new world of possibilities and quandaries. Last week, did you hear this one? Researchers revealed they'd managed to keep the brains of decapitated pigs alive for 36 hours. It's tempting to think it's part of the plot of some horror fantasy, but it's the kind of work that could tackle diseases like dementia of course, it's not just biotechnology that's pushing the boundaries. Artificial intelligence and robotics are playing a greater role in our lives. And it all comes with some pretty hefty questions like what it means to be human, how should we relate to our creatures, and should they have rights? To tackle some of these issues tonight, our panel, let me introduce them. Elizabeth Finkel is an Australian science journalist and editor-in-chief of Cosmos magazine. Elizabeth is second from the, uh, the far right. Upali Divisakera is a molecular biologist, science communicator and writer at the far end. Catherine McMullen, right next to me, is a screenwriter for film, television and VR. And Jonathan Parsons is the artistic director of media arts organisation Experimenta. He's also the creative director of Robotronica. Now, I'm going to start with our two scientists at the end. And where we are in bioengineering. Upali, can I begin with you? Much of Patricia Piccini's work involves these hyper-realistic sculptures of human-like beings called chimeras. In reality, scientists have already created chimeras. Can you explain exactly what a chimera is and how far we've got with them? So a chimera is um, an imaginary 
being, uh, well, through history, and it was supposedly an animal made up of different components. Uh, in a modern sense, a chimera is uh, a being that is comprised of different components, but they're genetically uh, part of the animal. They're, they have evolved biologically or through modification. And so we already have chimeras uh, in existence because we have genetically modified animals, we've mo modified uh, plants. But probably one of the most um, significant chimeras, I don't know if we can call it a chimera or... This is, again, the, the whole issue with uh, Patricia's work is that there are no particular boundaries. There's no place where you can draw a line between human and animal. And so we already use pigs to generate human hearts, or at least human-like hearts, uh, or organs that can be transplanted into humans. Um, we have modified sheep and uh, cows or bovines uh, to generate valves that can be implanted in humans. And so what we're generating already are animals with human components, or genetic components. And I guess another sort of way that we could talk about it is mosaics. We have genetic mosaics as well, where uh, you don't end up with a single kind of... Like, you might, you know... I don't know how many people might have used Ancestry.com to try and find their genetic ancestry or 23andMe. Uh, and so you might sequence your genome to see, you know, what comes up. But what sometimes can happen in organisms is that you don't end up with a straight line, you know, this is, this is what it is. You sometimes end up with different kinds of genotypes or gene sequences in the same organism. Ella, can I bring you in here? We, we see, obviously, a, a lot going on in this space. How far-fetched are Patricia Piccinini's ideas, these, these beings coming into creation and living amongst us? Can I answer your question in a minute? I just wanted to add one more thing, if I may, to what Upali said. So um, Upali was referring to uh, genetic chimeras, but we, we've actually created even more disturbing chimeras. Um, so um, a few years ago, a very bizarre experiment was done where they uh, injected human uh, cells into a mouse embryo, and these human cells turned into brain cells into, in, in this mouse that <laughs> developed. And the mouse was smarter. <laughs> oh, yes, that was recently reported. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, that, that, that sort of got all the ethicists in a flurry uh, and very worried about chimera types of research. And one of the reasons you might want to make these sorts of chimeras, apart from just basic research asking bizarre sorts of questions is that you might want to, for instance, um, grow a, a human pancreas inside a pig out of stem cells because we know stem cells are this universal putty that can make all sorts of organs, but it's really hard to make them just in a dish. And if you put human embryonic stem cells inside a growing pig embryo and you made sure that pig couldn't make its own pancreas, well, in theory, those human cells would turn into a human pancreas inside the pig, just the right size to go and transplant into someone. But now the ethicists are worried, well, uh-oh, what if some of those cells went into the pig brain and you got a smart pig and, you know, and at some point would this pig start becoming human-like? So anyway, so I just thought, felt I had to throw that in there. So, so um, how, how far-fetched do you think this idea is of, of us creating these hybrid humans? I think... OK, I have two answers. I think Patricia's stuff is far-fetched. And Patricia is not trying to make any sort of ethical or moral proposition. Patricia is an artist, and as she put it so eloquently herself, once upon a time, artists have generally responded to the mythology of the day. Once upon a time, they were responding to religious mythology and drawing all these wonderful pictures that we now see in cathedrals. And for Patricia, the dominant mythology today is given to us by science you know, Darwin's evolution and, and so on and so forth. And so she's responding to that mythology. She doesn't, I think, mean her representations to be some warning of here comes the future. She's responding and observing. Um, I don't think half-human, half-pig mothers suckling 
very human-like babies is going to happen ever. Is uh, that because you don't think the technology will ever get there or because we won't allow it? Because we won't allow it. And I, I do not believe we have any way, shape or form lost control over what we uh, sanction and do not sanction. Having said that, I think, you know, what is it, 2030 we're going to start sending people to Mars. I think the first person, first manned trip will be going to Mars. And maybe by 2050 we might have a colony there, maybe 2100. Now those, those colonists, they're going to have to put up with lower gravity, higher radiation. Wouldn't it be good if we could genetically modify them? Because we, we do know which genes to modify to give them radiation resistance, to give them greater bone density, to give them resistance to cancer. I think that could happen. And wouldn't that be the more ethical thing to do? So I don't think we'll be sending... I don't think we'll be creating cow people. But I wouldn't rule out that we might create future Martian colonists to be more adaptable to life on Mars. And I don't rule out that by 2100, when we'll all be living to 100, that we might be genetically engineering our babies to be able to age healthily so that they won't... so they'll get to 100 without dementia and cancer because we can, we can do... we will be able to do that. Jonathan, can I bring you in here? With the artistic chimeras, they represent... Uh, uh, they're they're insta instantly recognisable as, as human-like and they're unsettling. For some people, they're repulsive. Mm. This taps into uh, what we know as the uncanny, uncanny valley. Can you explain what that means? Because it doesn't just apply to robotics where it first yeah. was raised. Yeah, so uh, Mr Miro... Uh Misha Hiro Miro, who was a professor of robotics, so he coined the term in the 19, 1970, I think it was, the uncanny valley, to describe basically the way humans respond to... He was talking about it in uh, robotics and also in animation, about uh, the human form. And that the, the closer it gets to looking like a human, that, that you approach... It's, it's basically like a, a... I don't know, that sort of curve, a dip, and... Um, that at a certain point you reach a space where, where place where you start to feel quite unsettled by um, the apparition. The interesting thing is once it gets really close to being identical to human, you come back up again. So I guess the thing about what I find fascinating about Patricia's work is it sort of speaks to that um, uh, space and in fact through the various techniques she uses in some of the sculptural works, particularly where she works with empathy, She's really, for me, sort of narrowing that uncanny valley uh, space through her work um, that uh, the professor talked about in 1970. And I was interested to learn in robotics that there's sort of cultural differences to the way that we respond to human-like beings or, or images in our... or, or um, creations in our own image yeah. and that there's no mistake or no accident that a lot of the work that's happening in Japan uh, with robotics is happening there rather than somewhere else. Well, I th and I think the cultural issue is, is, a, is a space where actually there needs to be a lot more research, and this is also around... You, you see these debates starting to emerge now with also the development of AI, and uh, uh, Genevieve Bell, who's come back from the States and was at the Intel for a long time, trained as an anthropologist, is really... I think I've heard her talk really eloquently about the issues of, of, of culture and needing to think about culture and that we forget to th uh, remember that AI and a lot of these computer uh, systems have come out of Silicon Valley, a very particular cultural space. But in terms of um, responses to robotics, uh, there's certainly a lot of discussion about or theorising around um, why in Japan robotics is much more acceptable uh, than in the West. And, um, uh, and that has a lot... And, and the argument is that it actually comes from a cultural base, that basically the Shinto religion, you know, talks about, has an idea of uh, a spirit in all 
not just in humans, but all sorts of in inanimate objects. And so there's less barriers, you know, to having robotics in, in the environment. Catherine, could I bring you in here? The Uncanny Valley takes us into Frankenstein territory. And Patricia Piccinini has actually talked a lot about her fascination with the Mary Shelley um, classic. And she wonders why there's a lack of empathy for the monster. Yeah. And she wants us to have sympathy for her chimeras. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's really interesting with Frankenstein. Like, culturally, it's, you know, even just on an anecdotal level, when people say Frankenstein, you know, they, they are referring to the monster and Frankenstein is actually a doctor. And, and that's, a, that's a thing where, you know, in the cultural lexicon, you know, if something's Frankenstein, it's, it's cobbled together from different parts, but it actually refers to someone playing God and someone, um, you know, kind of brought down by his own hubris. Uh, and, I mean, it's, it's really interesting, like, that Mary, that Mary Shelley is considered kind of the first modern science fiction writer. Um, you know, there's kind of various people around the same time, kind of ten years before and things, but that, that's considered the, the, the first definitive work of science fiction. Um, and it's kind of... Its impact can't be understated. And I, I, even before kind of I'd... You know, I'm, I'm familiar with Patricia's work, but I'd, I had... I could have picked that that was a huge influence for her because it's so clear in her work that she's fascinated by the idea of why we're afraid of um, of other and and then blurring those barriers between other and and human and you know the whole kind of question about AI and and AI rights and all of that you know it's um we're pretty capable of treating humans really poorly people that we you know different races, you know, wrong sexuality or whatever. And, um, and so I find that whole debate fascinating because it's like, well, you know, AI do have, probably do have a requirement for rights, but we've, that hasn't stopped us in, from, you know, even when it's someone the same species as us. So. And, you know, from a sci-fi perspective, what is it that um, leads us to this fascination in, in these creatures that we create, either in our own image or, or these, these or monstrous dramatically creatures? dramatically different. Yeah. I mean, I think sci-fi is always about, um, at its core, it's still always about what it is to be human, and it's about what it is to be human even if the criteria change or the environment changes. You know, I, I, one of my favourite shows is Black Mirror, um, and, but even no matter how extreme the world becomes or the technology, it's always still excavating what it is to be human with that technology. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there are certain things that we'll always return to. Um, it's by, by questioning what's human elsewhere, we, we kind of then start to set our own moral boundaries. Um, you know, I, I find questions about um, meat e eating and ethics and, and all of that quite fascinating, especially with the rise of potentially lab-grown meat in that I, I do eat meat, but I, I'm quite torn about it. But, you know, if someone said that they ate dog, I would be, you know, obviously outraged. But that's completely just an arbitrary a line in the sand that we've, that we've drawn. You that's know. a cultural yeah. thing. Yeah. Interestingly, uh, I recently heard a lecture from Peter Singer, who's a renowned animal rights animal, yeah. activist who uh, is a vegetarian, or <coughs> vegan, and um, it, he'd quite happily eat manufactured meat in, in the in the laboratory from the laboratory. And and he's also said he had um, that that question of if he would use um, uh, organs grown in pigs if he was ill or if his children were ill. And he said that he would. In that there is you know, it's it's about where you draw your line in terms of the moral stance. Like it's it's interesting in that science doesn't have all the answers. Like the most efficient way in terms of you know, there's all the question about pigs and and kind of growing organs and really it'd be to grow a human without a brain and to harvest them. <laughs> like, like, that's grim, but it would be. But it's something that we refuse to do. But if it was just on pure efficiency, you know, and there's been a few films that have toyed with that idea because if you actually write down all the pluses and minuses, it's like, oh, well, it is the most efficient route there. It's just not the most, mm. the most ethical route there. And I must say the, uh, the idea of keeping the pig's brain alive for 36 hours in a decapitated head... <laughs> It felt like life imitating art, really. <laughs> yeah. Uberly, can I bring you back into the conversation? Obviously, as um, science advances and we see more work done in injecting human genes um, into animals, where do we draw the line about what is human and what is not? How do we, how do we look at that? Um, I don't think that's a question I can really answer 
in full. I think that's what Patricia's work pro um, provokes us to think about is where do we draw the line over what is human and what isn't? Where do we draw the line and say, well, if a pig has a human heart and maybe a few human brain cells, does that make it human or does it acquire rights, a few more rights? You know, does, does having a certain component of human genes make you more human if you're an animal? Uh, and so do we, if we regard the... Um, transgenic beings that we see in uh, the exhibition as being possibilities, and I think that they are possibilities, uh, although they may not happen, um, we have to ask ourselves, do you regard those beings as, as human? I mean, when I went around that exhibition, my first thought was, actually, I do. Uh, and suddenly all the boundaries disappear over who is human and who isn't. And I think the other thing is that, you know, we, we already struggle with accepting other humans as diff you know, who are different to us in appearance, uh, in terms of disability, uh, and um, you know we have a hierarchy of beauty and so on. So we already have such stratification um, within cultures and within society that it would be such a leap for us to make that transition to um, accepting transgenic uh, humans and, and transgenic animals. So do we then start, I think uh, recently one of the great apes or some primates, I'm, I can't remember which one, but they were being experimented on in labs and eventually they decided they wouldn't continue. But they ended up giving specific rights for primates. Uh, so then if, we, if we're going to give primates rights, where do we draw the line? So you might take the view of Peter Singer, which is much more, I'd say, for, for the mainstream, it's much more extreme in terms of animal rights. Uh, do we just, you know, treat all living beings with respect or at least multicellular ones and so on? So it's like there's endless kind of hierarchies that you have to go through and decisions that you have to go through about where you're going to draw that line. And it's just not easy to answer, I think. And Ella, with the kind of uh, uh, focus that we're having, I mean, uh, the advances are happening exponentially. How often <coughs> or how much are scientists really thinking about these questions about what's being created and the the ethical issues around that, the rights issues, whether something's going to be a human or not a human, or are they focused on purely the science? So I think just in the last few years, since the uh, advent of uh, CRISPR, I'm not sure if that means anything to you, but genetic engineering, I'm sure, means something <laughs> to you. We've had ge genetic engineering since the 70s. We've developed new types of crops and... Uh, animals and so on and so forth. But uh, what happened in 2012 is that we developed a much, much more efficient way of doing genetic engineering, a much more precise way of genetic engineering. We went, basically went from the Stone Age to uh, high tech in terms of genetic engineering with this tool called CRISPR. And it allows... Um, Whereas genetic engineering used to be a technology that required a very um, sophisticated laboratory, CRISPR is cheap and accessible. You could probably you could probably do it in high school. Just order a kit. Um, and one of the women who developed this technique, uh, Jennifer Doudna at Berkeley, uh, she developed it in 2012, and then. She wrote this article in Nature saying about a year later she stopped sleeping at night because she, she had this dream that she met Hitler and Hitler said, hmm, well tell done. me about this technology. <laughs> and she started to worry, well, what if somebody somewhere in North Korea starts, starts up this lab and decides to start genetically engineering a, a super race? Um, and then... Um, on the back of this CRISPR technology, in 2015, another scientist by the name of Kevin Esvelt developed this technique called a gene drive, where you can take um, a, a modified gene, modified by CRISPR, and normally when you try to change the DNA of a whole population, it's slow going because it gets diluted out. But with a gene drive, you can spread the new genetic mutation into a whole population really quickly. And, um, and um, it could have fabulous uses. In, um, it, it could render uh, malaria a thing of the past because if you can 
make these particular species of mosquitoes that carry malaria sterile, well, you can eradicate malaria from, from that part of the world. But Kevin Esfeld also is going around wringing his arms and saying, oh, my God, you know, I don't think we have strict enough controls. And um, he has this project in uh, Martha's Vineyard in, in the east coast of America where they have Lyme disease, which is carried by the rats. And his technology could be used to uh, change the population of rats so they're no, no longer carrying Lyme disease. But he won't go ahead and do it. He's having these uh, extended discussions with the community. So both Jennifer Doudna and Kevin Esfeld are cutting, new, new, are cutting a new mould, I think. I've never seen scientists walking around as, you know, they're, they're sort of like the Pandoras who've let these technologies out of the box and they're running around wringing their hands and saying, oh, my God, it's not very reassuring, what have we done? Ella. Yeah, <laughs> it's not, not reassuring. <laughs> I want to put a quote to you, Jonathan, from Patricia Piccinini. She says, we humans imagine we're at the top of the hierarchy and can control nature, but we can't. Perhaps these creatures' intelligence is the same or even better than ours. And I think this can apply to the chimeras or to AI in the future. She's really raising a question about our capacity not only to accept but respect these creatures in the mm. future, isn't she? Or perhaps uh, our, our attitude to controlling these creatures in the future. Yeah, I, but, I, I, you know, you were touching on where is, the, you know, where is the technology up to now and people's perceptions about that. Well, that's one of the interesting things as a, as a curator and a, you know, festival director about the huge gap between, uh, for some people, in what, where they think this technology is actually at. And, uh, and the reality of where it's at. So we so expect that it's much further advanced We expect than that it's it a lot further. So, you know, for the, at the last Robotronica, we had this... Um, I commissioned this work from a local dance um, company here, and they did this performance that we put at Robotronica called, called We, um, <laughs> Who Are These Robots? And they were basically performing, pretending to be a, a Brisbane start-up company, and um, as, as the GM of the business, he was introducing the various... Um, lines of his humanoid robot, which was five dancers, from a very basic one to a complete cyborg. Now, after they did the performance, when they were, and they were still in character, they were coming down into the audience, the number of, there were a number of people that came up and they were going up to them and going, God, the skin is amazing. How that you've achieved that? And it's so real. These and hyper-real robots. Yeah, yeah. The, no, so they actually were completely believing <laughs> that this fault. is... Well, indeed, this is, speaks to your territory <laughs> and, and the impact of popular culture and, and what that does. And I guess Robotronica was always set up to basically unpack and, uh, uh, you know, what is a fast and, and rapidly developing area of... Um, scientific endeavour in the robotics area um, and specifically by the university as a way to offer to the general public, well, this is actually where it's at. So I did feel a little bit irresponsible after having um, <laughs> presented this work and, and realised the in impact a way, of it. In a way, uh, if, if we're talking about technology that's at, at, a, at a certain point, our thinking of it's at, a, at another point, it gives us space to talk about some of these issues that we're discussing yeah. tonight, about... How do we treat them? What are the rules around these? Um, I've got a, a, a... I think it's an SMS that's come in that's just come off my screen, so I'll, I'll try to work out how to get back to you, Catherine, because I thought it would be a great one for you. But it, it was essentially around um, the, the... This is it. What's our obsession with recreate... So this is the... Uh, uh, has been submitted via SMS. What's our obsession with recreating creatures similar to ourselves from Frankenstein to modern science? Where's our imagination, Catherine? Well, I think, like, the, the question kind of answers it in itself in that where, you know, I remember reading a study about um, teaching dolphins sign language and that halfway through the study or I, I, possibly even near the end, they went, well, why are we trying to teach them our language? Why aren't we focusing on learning theirs? And it was this real kind of cultural kind of thing where we were placed at the centre and everything else was other and had to come to us. And it's even applied, you know, in Western culture kind of, you know, whenever something is colonised, it's about, oh, we're bringing in better technology or better way of living, even though that's not necessarily true. It's very, it's very centric. Um, and I think, you know, it's fundamentally we, we only understand consciousness 
it, it take, it's quite a leap to understand consciousness from another point of view. Like, you know, understanding that a pig might have the intelligence of, um, I think it's a toddler, um, is, is, it requires a way of shifting how you think about consciousness and intelligence. Um, there's a, a... Well, it challenges our hierarchy as well, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, and also our, we don't understand our own consciousness. consciousness. So, you know, then so a lot of the robotics professors talk about yeah. that, you know, from a philosophical perspective. The reason Hiroshi Shiguru wants to do his doppelgangers mm. is he's exploring, you know, what it means to be human and yeah. understanding what that consciousness might be. And he very much is about, it's not just how you, the robot looks, but also how it behaves in, in terms of our response to it. Yeah, absolutely. It, there's um, one of my favourite films, Ex Machina, and if anyone doesn't want to have it spoiled, lock your ears very briefly. Um, <laughs> but it's, it kind of deals with questions of consciousness and ethics and the, you know, fun, it's about um, a, a man that does a Turing test on a very feminine, very beautiful robot that's kind of androgynous but very clearly feminine. And um, there's actually a difference. I've read the script and there's a difference between the ending of the script and the film. Um, in the film, there's kind of... Uh, it, it, the man thinks she's fallen in love with him and, and then... Um, but she locks him in the house and kind of leaves to her freedom. And in, in the script, there's this really pivotal moment that I, I think it's such a shame they left it out, where um, for one moment of the film you see the world from her point of view. And she had been sketching these things um, that was kind of like... It looks like sound waves... And in the script, you see that you see it the world as she sees it, and it's 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 not code, but it's it's effectively layers of sound and movement, and it it, it isn't anything even slightly humanoid. And you suddenly realise the, that the idea that she could fall in love with this human man is is ridiculous. She's not human. She's something. She's conscious. But she's something else and something alien. And and that's what I think really good art can do. It can make you just slightly move out of that, you know, what the question asked, which is why we're so obsessed with trying to make other things human, with making robots or AI as close to human consciousness as possible because in reality that consciousness will look very different. Like, I, I'm not sure if an AI will want to destroy humankind. I think it will have other strange different goals because that's us that's assuming... Hu that's, that's humans' jobs. Exactly. Yeah, we, we, you know, I think they... I'm not sure what AI will do, but I, I don't... We're assuming that it will think like other humans will, but it, it won't. Jonathan, what is our obsession with creating a robot in our own image? There's been so much work done on that. Yeah, well, as I said, I touched on there, I think a number of them speak about it from, I guess, a philosophical perspective of understanding what it means to be human. But there's also... I was speaking to a colleague at QT, Professor Jonathan Roberts, and he said, well, there's also this is more the engineering approach, which is that... The world that we've created, certainly in our cities, is basically designed for the average human. So you actually to have robots working effectively in that space, it would be really helpful to have humanoid robots. And it made me laugh because I've read a lot about the much more philosophical approach and it was just a very practical, straight-down-the-line approach. And he talked about actually... Uh, his, the example he used was actually about Fukushima when they were sending in robot, robot after robot into this space that had staircases and all the rest of it. And actually the biggest issue was the robots kept getting stuck. <laughs> and that actually compounded the whole problem of rehabilitation of that site. The Daleks of a sort. Yeah, yeah, that's right, <laughs> exactly. The, then, you know, I think with Japan, who was really developing some of these... Or Hiroshi Ishiguro is developing humanoid robots... They have this demographic problem where they have an ageing population and who's going to do all the work, who's going to look after all these old people, who's going to look after the children. And so, as you say, they need humanoid robots to work in human-like environments. Mm. We're not far behind in Australia. Which, which brings me to yes. cyborgs, Oopley. Yes. <laughs> How, how much of a potential is there of us realising the world of fantasy that we, we live in so far in terms of our, our thoughts about cyborgs and, and, and the role they may play in our society? Wow, how long have you got? Um, <laughs> I, think, I think we're actually very, very close to this. I mean, you can ask the question, where do we draw the line and say this is a cyborg and this isn't? Like, if you have a pacemaker, if you've got any kind of um, artificial electronic implant, are you... <laughs> A cyborg? Are you partially a cyborg? Uh, but I guess we're, we're considering things that we more popularly think of as a cyborg. And so 
I think we're quite close to it. I mean, we've got a few generations, I think, uh, of, of work to get there, but it's very close to the point that um, uh, some of the some things that PhD students are working on, for example, are nanostructures that can um, help mend neurons uh, and increase neuron growth in the brain. So, for example, in Alzheimer's patients, uh, if you can implant these, you can try and retrieve memories and to repair things that are happening in the brain so that it will encourage neuron growth. Um, and that's just through material science, creating different little surfaces and things like that. People are implanting chips into themselves. Um, we're looking at, uh, in my lab in particular, looks at a lot of... Uh, electronic devices that are sensors that you can just paint onto your skin and it has a Wi-Fi connection and you can determine if you're, you know, if, if, if you're diabetic, you can consider, uh, you know, how much insulin you might need. Uh, if you've got high blood pressure, you can monitor various um, parameters like your heartbeat and blood pressure. Uh, and the other thing is to then go to the next step of implanting devices. So um, creating artificial <coughs> organs until we get to the point that we can grow an organ in a jar, or say we can grow a pancreas in a jar, or a heart in a jar, that we want to create these sort of intermediate devices that will fulfil those functions until we uh, get to that point. And it might be that people prefer to have an electronic version that can be upgraded, can be you know um, personalised, and can be uh, much more, uh, much faster and and, and better than um, a, you know a traditional human heart even. So I don't know if anyone's seen the film Anatomy. It's a German film where they uh, an anatomy professor works to secretly install um, materials into athletes so that he can control the athletes. And so, in a sense, that's, that's another, um, I think, aspect of it as well. So it's like uh, creating um, superhumans that can perform specific tasks or win races and, and so on. So we're, I think we're heading in that direction very quickly without thinking too carefully about it. I think we might find we might have three types of Olympic Games. Yes. The Paralympics, yes. the normal <laughs> and the augmented. Uh, yeah, the augmented, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, how, how close do you think we are to this oh, notion of, of, of you know, the cyborgs that we imagine? Yeah, well, it's interesting. I mean, this is one of the things that I think this is where the arts and arts sciences actually in the dialogue between the arts sciences mm -hmm. I think is an incredibly fertile area and I, certainly from my perspective I'm seeing the real resurgence in that whole territory and the reason one of the reasons I think artists can play an incredibly uh, important role in imagining uh, the space for scientific invention we've seen that happen over and over again uh, and you know it's not by accident that many scientists are also artists um, I, in terms of specific around, specifically around cybernetics, at, uh, the last Robotronica in 2015, or did, um, we had an artist uh, named Neil Harbison, uh, who is, as I understand it, he was certainly talking about himself as being the first um, government uh, authorised cyborg. So in his British passport, he now has cyborg. Now, the reason he... Uh, did that was because the cybernetic system that's implanted in his, uh, into his brain was to deal with a, a genetic disorder that he had, which was that he could only see the, the environment in grayscale. And basically he's had an antenna implanted into his head that reads colour as sound and he's learnt what each of those different sounds will mean in terms of the colour of his environment. Now you can imagine he was having a lot of trouble getting through <laughs> uh, airport Security. The metal detector <laughs> um, was going off. Yeah, uh, and uh, and so there was a whole discussion with um, uh, the, um, uh, the the British government about needing to actually have that in his passport because otherwise it was a constant problem for him. So he's now actually certified by the British government as a cyborg. He's a re he's an interesting character. He's also set up the Cyborg Foundation, which is. Um, uh, is, uh, he is basically an activist um, uh, wanting to support cyborg rights. You know, he talks about certain cybernetic systems. You know, you touched on some of the ones that we're already seeing happen, whether they should legally be defined as body parts as opposed to mechanical devices. And um, he also talks about... Uh, uh, in a really interesting way, is about um, pushing the boundaries of augmentation. 
He sees nothing wrong with, you know, having, I guess, the... I'm not an expert in biology, animal biology, but I'm thinking the ex, you know, of the sight of a, an owl or whatever, you know, what are the animals that have superb seeing? He sees no issue with why not. Um, so I think we'll see more and more of this happening and I think the artists are a really great way to uh, have these discussions. I think there need to be a lot more of these discussions, um, actually. It's interesting, though, because, I mean, I, I think we will, you know, science fiction... Often, it's not that it predicts the future, it's that it does shape the future in mm. terms of, you know, I, I think one of the pivotal people that created the World Wide Web quoted a science fiction story as being something that it, that it you know, captured his interest. Yeah. So, I mean, it kind of, it's not just a, oh, that writer was amazing at predicting what would happen, they sometimes shaped that. But it's also, you know, so many of the augmentations we're talking about, I don't know if it's me being cynical, but it will be the top percentage of the population and it won't be everyone else. And, and you know, Indeed. and it's... And it's true about, you know, um, I, I was telling a friend about this and I was saying, this is very far-fetched. And I was like, no, this is happening now about um, Silicon Valley. The show had a plot about Blood Boys, which is um, the Silicon Valley billionaires that um, get blood transfusions from people that are younger because there was very, very early research that says that it might help them age better. And it's like, well, OK, so that, that technology is might be developed. You know, you might be able to live to 100 with... No dementia and perfect eyesight, but it won't be everyone. Yeah, it will yeah, be no, it will be one in a hundred. And yeah. this is the issue with biotech as well, isn't it, Ella? That uh, we're talking about potentially access by those who can afford it. I, I think initially, and then you you do get it trickling down. Um, I was just going to say, you know, there there are much uh, less sensational cyborgs, cochlear implants. Mm. Um, soon we're going to have retinal implants, some being, you know, being developed here at Monash and Melbourne University. Um, you have people with Parkinson's disease who have um, electrodes implanted in their brain to control their movement disorders. They're talking about doing that for people suffering with their depression. So we have more prosaic uh, examples well, of that. That's yeah. true, but I think w what's really important is the sort of cultural debates around that. Certainly, you know, my understanding is, you know, within the deaf community, the cochlear implant has been a very controversial um, development because of the argument that it's erasing a culture and destroying a language. Or the, um, the questions around uh, the rates of Down syndrome, and I think it's in Iceland where they've basically eradicated it because almost everyone chooses chose to, chose to screen and, and then not go forward with the pregnancy. And, and there's a real, you know, there was a, a, a really interesting debate on both sides, especially in the States, where people were just going, you're effectively saying, I have or my children have no worth. Mm. Um, and then the same, same debate in the deaf community yeah, yeah. around it. Yeah. And, Let's talk about... Yeah. Sorry, sorry, just, just your point about equality. Um, you know, we're celebrating some interesting um, anniversaries this year. It's 20 years since we developed embryonic stem cells. It's 40 years since the first IVF baby was born, Louise Brown, in 1978. Uh, five million babies have been born through IVF. And it's not just to the rich. It's to marginalised groups. It's to people who could never have dreamed of having children, um, through IVF, you know, uh, gay couples. Um, uh, Alan Trounsen is, who was the developer of IVF in Australia, one of the pioneers and of <laughs> embryonic stem cells. He lived through two revolutions, uh, pioneered two revolutions. He's now working in Africa, trying to help bring IVF to Africa. So um, would you deny people technology because of an argument that, no, only the rich will get it to start off with. Um, that, that is so in yeah. an Australian context, though. Like, America, yeah. IVF is not... Like, that might be $100,000 very easily. Yeah. Like, that's... Because I, 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 I agree with yeah. your point that in Australia yeah. it's fairly yeah. accessible, but we're still a relatively egalitarian... You know, mm. obviously we have stratas, but we are a relatively egalitarian society, yeah. whereas yeah. America, like, most people don't have access to IVF there. They never will. Like, it's, it's just, you know, it's and, and therefore certain people, if they have problems having babies, don't have any other recourse. Yeah, it's I, more I mean, a problem of the American health system well, than, yeah, yeah, than IVF, but, I would yeah. say. Yeah. These, these are certainly, you know, 
debates <coughs> and arguments that we have within very much an Australian context where it is a much more relatively egalitarian society and we have better access to public health and perhaps to regulation as well. Whereas you can now get CRISPR kits online. And so I both agree with Elizabeth that, you know, we may prevent um, sort of transgenic beings, uh, humans, I should say humans, transgenic <laughs> humans. I don't know what to say. Um, <laughs> transgenic humans, um, as, as Patricia's um, created in her work. But also at the same time, there are a lot of people who work outside of the regulated environment now because it's much more accessible. There are more independent laboratories that are not associated with universities being set up. People can order these things online. You can buy a whole lab all the labware that you might need on Amazon.com. Not that I have done that. Um, but <laughs> So we can't be really sure that we can control all of it and we might ha introduce within Australia a strict um, regime of regulation. Um, but that may not happen elsewhere. And in other countries, there's next to no reg regulation. Let's consider, you know, in different parts of Asia and so on. Um, the Chinese have already gone ahead and used CRISPR on human embryos, and so they're already down that path. And though CRISPR is one of the best technologies that we have for increasing the precision of genetic engineering, when they started doing it on embryos, they ended up with mosaics, uh, genetic mosaics as well. So it's not easy to transform um, and control the outcomes that you might want in, in, in a human embryo. And so you might end up with these sorts of intermediates, you know, put that in quote marks, um, with different kinds of uh, transgenic humans that might arise as, as a result. Can, can I just raise something yes. provocative? Um, so, okay, so 40 years since IVF, 20 years since embryonic stem cells. I wasn't following the debate over IVF, but I certainly followed it closely over stem cells. And we had an enormous argument or a debate in uh, Australia uh, echoing the one that happened all over the world. And a lot of the concerns that were raised 20 years ago were, oh, you're going to create things like what Patricia created, the cow or the pig, human chimera. Um, you're going to create clone armies. If, if you allow all this, it's going to happen. Well, 20 years on, you know, show me the clones. Show me the, the pig-human chimeras. Um, the same debates around genetically manipulated food. Show me one authenticated, uh, well-evidenced case of any, any harm coming from uh, genetically modified crops. Show me the evidence. Ubali, we've got a question here that's been submitted um, mm -hmm. via SMS. Why the constant emphasis on ethics? Why does it even matter in the big scale of evolution, scientific progress and greater good? I guess it goes to the heart of what kind of future we want to create for ourselves and what kind of society we want to create for ourselves. So as someone who's a biologist in an engineering world at the moment, there's already a difference in the way that basic basic scientists, well, scientists who do basic research versus engineers regard the work that they do, I think. And I think that engineers tend to be a lot more, I'm going to solve the problem, but I haven't necessarily looked at the entirety of the implications of what happens. And also engineers are not particularly good at biology, but um, <laughs> they're getting better though. Uh, <laughs> so I, I think that um, it's, we, we need to have these discussions because we really need to think about what kind of future we want to create. And it also matters because, for example, if we're developing AI, what kind of, um, how are we going to develop the AI? So at the moment, it's primarily developed by Silicon Valley, Valley types, but it's going to be used in different societies and cultures around the world. Mm. So, and by dis different sexes. And, and different, <laughs> different sexes, uh, different genders, different kinds of people. So the kinds of values that influence this development at the moment are quite limited, and I think we need to have a much more diverse input um, into the development of these technologies as well so that we can consider the implications of it. And also, back to the, the question of access, who will have access to these technologies? And so, uh, we, you know, it, it would be great if it were, you know, if it were to do with um, 
the treatment of some diseases, then it would be better to have universal access uh, versus, uh, you know, um, just the wealthiest people accessing it. So rather than... Um, I don't think that's something that we can just leave to a kind of um, chaotic chance or, you know, just sort of evens out over time. I think it's a really important discussion that we need I to have. The, this, the Ameri- I don't know whether you've heard the, the quote by the American philosopher E. Um, o. Wilson where he says the challenge for... 21st century, you know, humanity is that um, we have Paleolithic emotions, yes. medieval institutions, <laughs> and godlike technology, and I think that speaks to why there needs yeah. to be debates about exactly. ethics, because then that flows onto legal frameworks and all sorts of ways that we can manage what is increasingly looking like godlike technology. Well, speaking of godlike technology, I wanted to ask you, Jonathan, uh, about Sophia. She yes. came to Australia last year and declared on ABC TV that uh, robots deserve more rights than humans because they had less mental defects. Uh, she'd also told a, a festival in the US that uh, it would destroy all humans. Sophia's also been granted citizenship in Saudi mm. Arabia. Mm. <laughs> so there's obviously this wider debate going on around the rights for robots. What's driving that? And I, w- I would add to that. I've also heard uh, who was it? Someone. Uh, it was a Japanese um, academic saying that they're better Buddhists <laughs> because they have infinite, infinite patience. <laughs> um, so, 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 how broad is this conversation around these rights? Uh, the rights debate, well, look, I'm not an expert in that area. I mean, certainly, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, my key role is, is presenting basically these developments through the Robotronica. Um, I think that um, it's clear, and we've certainly picked up in the, in the talks program there about um, all sorts of ethical issues because we're seeing, you know, what about robots in policing? What about autonomous vehicles? You know, who becomes responsible if there's an accident? We're all already seeing those debates, and all of these debates have an ethical dimension. And um, judges being um, programmed versus, like, not humanoid, but, you know, weighing up all the factors and giving someone seven years versus ten in, in terms of sentencing. And the fascinating thing there is that it might be more even than human judges. Well, who there have, is trials know, going on in the US, and I know yeah. that there's a lot of concern in the legal sector about that because of system bias, mm. which is something that... Well, that, you know, uh, black defendants have, you yeah, know, get right. significantly more jail time on exactly the same charge. Charges. And, and you know, I think um, the point that was raised before about that we, we are still coming at it from a Western base, we're coming at it from a very individu- individ- individualistic <laughs> point of view. Yeah. You know, it's, a lot of the stuff to do with self-driving cars is that, you know, we, we protect the passenger at all costs versus everyone else. You know, we protect the driver or the consumer who will buy your car again versus the pedestrians. And there's some really worrying kind of intersection of corporations and ethics and... and uh, well, yeah, and, and cultural cultural issues. Again, a lot of the work that... Uh, Ars Electronic has got a great project that's looking at autonomous vehicles and they're looking at the cultural dimension of it. They're working with some of the German um, auto manufacturers and how in a, in a mixed human robot... You know, a lot of people... Well, there's another part to this too. They say the best thing would be to just switch it all to robots. Mm. But actually there's going to be transition period, and that's the danger period. So how's a robot going to understand the signals, the very subtle signals that we send to a human passenger that I want to cross the road, or is that car going to stop? You know, all of those sorts of cultural dimensions. And that will be different in different cultures. There'll be different traditions around how you navigate uh, the city and, you know, roads. And, Upali, I, I know that you also have some concerns in biotechnology about this transition period that we'll go through yeah. in, in the in the quest for perfection and, and what the questions are around that. Yeah, um, I, I think that uh, one of the things that Patricia's work also highlights is that uh, are these transgenic humans um, byproducts or are they... The, are they the intermediates uh, that you might you, know, you might call them intermediates on that way to generating um, exactly the kind of offspring that you want to design? So you know we, we talk a lot. Of, it, one of the big science fiction tropes and something that's kind of already <laughs> happening is genetic testing of embryos and trying to uh, implement um, 
particular desired features in children. So, you know, try to make your children more intelligent. Perhaps you have a preference for eye colour and hair colour and skin colour. And, and so the, the problem with that is that in the meantime, as we've already seen with CRISPR, CRISPR was great. And also it still takes a lot of work to get to that point where we can use it well and precisely in, say, a whole organism and then to carry that, say, modified gene through the generations. And so in that time, and this is the intermediate time that we are in, this is where all of these problems arise. Uh, and we have the potential for these beings, mm. humans. Uh, there's a, I'll bring in a question here, either for maybe Upali or Ella. A distinct difference between humans and all animals is our ability to imagine. Do you think AI will gain imaginative ability? You know, that's the big question. Um, so Sophia, you know, may have citizenship, but she's nothing like a human. Her ability to uh, react in conversation is, is just a trick, one, like one of those... Yeah. Um, programs that was developed a few years ago with Rogerian therapy where you, uh, you respond to the question because it elicits particular cues in your programming. So she's not uh, intelligent. Um, neither is uh, Erika, the, the latest humanoid robot from Hiroshi Ishiguro. Um, and, and yet it's very confusing. You know, we know that um, robots can now beat Go Masters. They can... You know, they can do all these fantastic feats. They're better at surgeons, at um, analysing uh, pa pathology slides. So you think, wow, if they can do all these incredible things, you know, are they more intelligent than us? And, and yet when I speak to roboticists, they're generally incredibly disparaging of robot intelligence. And they say it's, it's just, you know, they can only operate within this, this particular set of parameters that they've been programmed to operate in. Um, and th this thing that is still uniquely human is this um, ability to be scientific, come up with hypotheses, come up with something completely new and be imaginative. So um, I think that's the big question. I, I guess I think... It's just a matter of time. I guess that would be what I'd bet on. And the ability to self-replicate, I think, as well. Like, you know, as soon as, as soon as something can propagate itself, that, to me, marks a significant shift. You know, they don't need us anymore, <laughs> basically. Yeah, I, I partly agree. Actually, I think I largely agree with you on, on that issue. I think it's a question... It's a matter of time. So, at the moment, the, the best AI we have is, is, is you know... The best AI, the programming you have is whoever the programmer is and, and how much they've done, how much work they've put into it. Um, but I'm sure that there must be some point down the line where it becomes sentient. Or at least, I don't know if I hope so or that I hope it doesn't happen. Um, we don't really want to end up with another hell, I guess. No, we An don't. actual hell situation. <laughs> or do we? Because C Catherine, that would be amazing. <laughs> Catherine, should we be more concerned about the AI already coded in social media and online advertising than this future humanoid robot? Um, I mean, I'm pretty worried by corporations. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm a realist. Like, I, I think a lot of this, this, uh, these questions, it, it really, it's, it's kind of a blue sky approach versus what, what the people that have developed it will probably do with it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's social media and online advertising is interesting. It's, you know, there's, there's an incredible question of, Ethics, or I mean, all of the Facebook stuff, you know, that's coming out now around what they did with the election. There's, there's a real concern around, you know, did they have any, did they have obligations that they weren't fulfilling, you know, by allowing people to target swing voters and then blasting them with false information? Did Facebook have any responsibilities, or are they just a corporation whose only responsibilities to their shareholders? You know, and I, I don't, I think we're, um, I'm not sure I would turn that as AI necessarily. Um, but I think it's certainly, you know, it's like human behavioural modification. Um, and, I, you know, I, again, I, I think government is always trying to catch up. You know, there'll be an issue and then they'll legislate it away. But, it, you know, iteration is always slightly ahead. We're always scrambling to, for the law to catch up with advancements in, in any technology, not just in this area. It's always, you know, there was... Um, 
there was a reproductive law in Victoria which was so strict, the set of criteria, that no one could actually have a surrogate child here. No one hit all the criteria. So I think there was one or two born and they complete, had to completely overhaul it because it didn't match what the technology could do. Um, so the law, you know, struggles sometimes with how quickly things move along. And a lot of this technology goes beyond domestic law. This is, mm. this is international. This is sort of really global. Is there enough of a conversation that's happening around these things? I'm going to open this up to the entire panel. Well, it's interesting. Just um, a few weeks ago, <clears throat> in an issue of the magazine Nature, there were two articles on uh, calling for a much wider conversation on CRISPR. So I mentioned that two of the scientists who were involved in developing it have been wringing their hands about, you know, oh, my God, what have we done? Um, and even though, you know, there's been a lot, of, a lot of meetings and discussions about CRISPR and what's <coughs> come out of these meetings is generally, well, we should allow, um, for instance, uh, research on human embryos to continue, but it's only the research stage. These embryos never develop past a couple of weeks. Um, so we're not having crispered babies anytime soon, but we should continue the research. So um, these two articles were written by uh, one by a couple of American ethicists, another one by a, a British ethicist, and they were both saying, look, these discussions have not been nearly broad-ranging enough. You're talking about technologies that could transform the way we have babies, they could transform the way we grow our crops, they could transform our environment. Just uh, last week there was a report that we can now uh, change the genome, change the genetics of coral with CRISPR. And as we all know, we're rapidly losing the world's coral. We've just lost half of the Great Barrier Reef and there's a serious push to try to accelerate the evolution of coral so that it will survive through the next 50 years of climate change and now we have CRISPR working in, in coral. Well, anyway, so there is this call for a much broader conversation on, on these issues. Mm. I think uh, what I'd add to that is I think... Uh, there's always it's always useful to have more conversation about these issues you know everything that we've ranged across you know in tonight's panel but it's more the types of conversations that I'm concerned about because if you in a lot of the mainstream media you you get you know the robot you know basically the end of the world with the AI and right you know it's it's the it's the fear thing to actually get more clickbait on their website or you know sell what's left of their print newspapers and um, <laughs> And then right against that, you have this sort of utopian uh, vision that's being... Um, and you need to ask the question, of who's, who, where's this source coming from? Is often, it's from the tech companies and they're selling products. You touched on this. You know, they're basically corporations coming out of uh, Silicon Valley. So I guess whether more or less, I'm not sure, but different quality conversations, more complex... Uh, com uh, an ability to have a space for more complex conversations would be very helpful. And I think that's where, you know, your magazine's really helpful. Oh. Events like... Well, <laughs> absolutely, because it's really crucial. And Robotronica is really important and other events like that to demystify. And, Catherine, the role of art in this is mm. very important as well. Yeah, I mean, there, there was a question that came up before about Westworld and how close we are to it. And I kind of think... Like, the thing is, Westworld is, in many ways... It's regressive in terms of, you know, if you put slaves in the position of robots, that's that's pretty accurate to what it what it is and what it's saying. And, you know, I think um, we're not that far away from Westworld, but I, I don't think that's in terms of the technology. I think that's in terms of, you know, how separate different strata of society are becoming. Because what Westworld is fundamentally is there are the haves and there is the world of the have-nots and the haves come and play in it. That's That's really what that story to me is about. Um, like I find one of my favourite rants to go on about Star Wars is that um, the story of the droids in that is effectively that of slaves. And that's never how it's coded, but that's, you know, they're, they're the happy slaves in the narrative and that's never really explored and, and kind of... I think that's often what stories about robots are trying to unpack. They're trying to unpack ideas of class and systematic kind of um, <coughs> bias and discrimination and... You, 
through science fiction, it's sometimes a bit more palatable than, you know, actually going back to your own society and going, oh, you know, we say that anyone can be prime minister, but isn't it strange that it's always people that have gone to private school, you know, like... I've been a lawyer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I Oberly, think... where do you see the role of art, particularly from a scientific perspective? Of art? Yeah. I think... Um, it... I think uh, I, I, was, I was really moved by this exhibition and I think it really um, forces us to engage with these really complex uh, questions. Uh, science and technology are encroaching so much into our everyday life. I mean, that's, you know, every, every, every news bulletin says this. Uh, it's not news. But it, it can force us to confront these things in a space that's uh, maybe a little safer. Um, Patricia's work is very empathetic and very beautiful. I found myself really moved almost to tears by her sculptures. Uh, and I thought that many of them were also really beautiful. And I guess the other thing is that it forces, art forces us to think about what we do as scientists, to, to give it a much more broader context. Because I think as scientists and engineers, we are very much focused on, say, product uh, or generating a particular outcome. And then placing that, those, you know, what happens and the implications of what we do. <coughs> like, yeah, we've discovered CRISPR and it makes our life easier for experiments. Um, but then what, for what we choose to use it for, what happens? Uh, to the wider environment, to the societies that we live in. And I think the other big question is, like, it forces us to ask, do we want to keep repeating the same mistakes that we've made as humans? Do we want to keep replicating the societies and structures that we've already got in place, that we have had entrenched for centuries, or do we want to create something new? And what will that look like? Ella, I know you've been on a journey with Patricia Piccinini's art... Is there a danger of art misinforming people, of, of setting up this view of a dystopian future and, and creating fear about the technology that we're looking for, given that we are still having a debate about genetic, genetically modified food, for example? Well, Patricia's art has been used that way a lot for, as, as a scaremongering tool, great, uh, greatly to her dismay. Um, I think the... the the sculpture in the exhibition here, the young family, <coughs> which shows the pig, human-like mother with her babies. She did that uh, originally for the Venice Biennale in 2002. And um, yes, it's been used on countless sites and, and was used during the stem cell debates to show, look, <laughs> look what's going to happen. Um, interestingly, um, you know, I, as you say, I've been... I really have been on a journey. I got invited to write the essay for Patricia's book, one of the essays for Patricia's book. And it was, um, yeah, it put me in a funny position because when I'd first encountered Patricia's work, I didn't have a positive reaction to it. I thought, oh, no, another dystopian, you know. Um, but, you know, I've, I've definitely been on a journey and um, and for me... I think Patricia, as an artist, is, is amoral. I don't think she's making any moral statement. She's experiencing and inviting us to reflect <coughs> oh, on, on, on the way she's experiencing this mythology of science and technology. And, and for me, it's, it, it's, I think she's been a great success because it's led me to reflect and change my narrative. I used to think in terms of, well, we have checks... And balances on science, there's no sl slippery slope. We, we draw a line in the sand and we stick to our, you know, ethical positions. And I realise that's not true because we, we used to have an ethical line in the sand that said, you don't touch embryos, you don't try to meddle with their DNA. And we used to have a, a moral line in the sand that said, you don't make human-animal chimeras. And I've seen both those moral lines in the sand erased. And, and I realised, well... It doesn't mean we're, you know, in a moral crisis or moral catastrophe. This is the nature of science and technology. It changes our world. It changes boundaries. And we have to adapt. We have to adapt with our ethics and think, well, OK, you know, what does this mean? I don't think yuck factor is a good way to respond to this stuff. So what I'm trying to say is I think Patricia's art has been a great success for me and in, invited me to reflect and taken me somewhere quite different in my thinking. 
Uh, just on a final note, Jonathan, you talked earlier about the importance of art in opening up these conversations. What we've also seen emerge is bioart. What do you see the role of bioart in our understandings? Well, I think, uh, again, it, it plays similar sorts of function here of, of actually has the possibility... It, I mean, art asks questions, really, in, you know, or many art, uh, and, and I don't think it's necessarily it's about finding the answer, but more about posing the question um, or questions and so that we do have these conversations. And certainly here in Australia, there's a whole range of artists that are working in what's called the bioart, you know, territory, um, uh, and... Um, one of the significant, and almost all of them have gone through uh, a really significant organisation that's based in uh, the University of Western Australia, Symbiotica, um, uh, which is an re artist research laboratory that's uh, basically looking at research, artists researching in the life sciences. And it's art, and Svenja Kratz, Helen Pointer, uh, Oren Katz, I can reel off many, many Australian artists that are working in these fields. Um, and, and they're inspired by what's happening in terms of the developments, but they're posing questions through their artwork um, so that we have these debates. Uh, well, we've, we've canvassed a lot of questions, and uh, I think there's still a lot of questions that uh, we need to talk about in the future, as you say. Thank you very, very much for a really enjoyable conversation. And thank you all for joining us tonight for this final session of the GOMA Talks. Patricia Piccinini, uh, Conversations. Uh, and for also for all of you who took part in the um, SMS and, and Twitter conversation with us. Uh, tonight's GOMA Talks is going to be available to watch again online at the Quagoma YouTube channel, which is through the gallery's website. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, you could uh, also uh, either podcast it or hear it broadcast in a few weeks' time on RN, uh, on the Big Ideas program. Please join me in thanking our guests today for their generosity and insightfulness tonight.